All right, welcome everyone. I hope you've been enjoying the Resilient Vermont Conference so far. We're excited to get started with this panel on thermal and transportation. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to my co-moderator, Valeria, to introduce the topic. All right. Um, I think it would be good to introduce the panelists. So oh, you wanna have... introduce the panelists first? Um, yeah, okay, sure. <laughs> Let me introduce our esteemed panel. <laughs> uh, so on my left here, Jen Wallace-Broder works for Vermont Energy uh, Investment Corporation. She sets the organization's strategic direction for transportation work, oversees a staff of consulting professionals, and leads clean transportation development across the country. Uh, to her left is Neil Lunderville, who's the president and CEO of Vermont Gas. He recently served as general manager of the Burlington Electric Department. Prior to that was co-founder and CEO of NG Advantage um, and was appointed uh, by Governor Peter Shumlin in 2011 to lead recovery efforts for after Tropical Storm Irene, which is extremely relevant to today's <laughs> topics. That's okay. Um, Maura Collins became executive director of the Vermont Housing Finance Agency in January 20, 2019, but has been with the agency for a total of 20 years. In the last few years, she's been working to develop financing strategies for weatherization in the thermal sector. And then at the end of the table is Professor Michael Cross, professor of engineering here at Norwich University, where he teaches classes in circuits, electronics, energy systems, and engineering design. All right. So my name is Valeria Reyes. I'm student from Norwich University. I've studied civil engineering and this is my first time moderating so I'm really excited. Um, to start with I would like to enter the conversation by saying the relationship between like the general relationship with Irene, emissions, COVID and our main point for this session which is thermal and transportation. So we're looking back to look forward here so Remember that with no coastlines, Vermont might have seen an unlikely candidate to be devastated by a tropical storm. After Irene swept through, Vermont set about understanding the devastation and working toward resilience. The COVID-19 pandemic is having significant impacts on Vermonters across the state. Everyday people confront new challenges, and the future for many seems bleak and unpredictable. This taught us that we need to be resilient against not just future storms, but other types of disaster. Um, but if we go forward in the correct direction, we believe Vermont's future is brighter than what it lies ahead. The health of our families, economy, and community is completely tied to the health of our environment. So, um, low carbon technologies will keep money in Vermont and create jobs while reach the greenhouse gas reduction. Because the vast majority of Vermont's emission come from transportation and thermal sector, it is in those sectors that the most significant improvements are needed. So we're gonna focus on those two uh, major topics, which is um, transportation and thermal sector in this session. Thank you. Right. So I'm gonna let the panelists introduce themselves now just with a few words about sort of how their work overlaps with resilience mm -hmm. and how the, that intersection between resilience and emissions um, comes into play. So Jen, if you wanna start us off. Sure thing. So I'm here to really focus on the transportation sector. Um, uh, in the introduction, I work at VEIC. We're very focused on um, strategies to increase uh, electric vehicles in the state. Um, but there are a lot of different um, ways to think about uh, transportation. And so I'm gonna sort of frame this up in the way that I think about resiliency and climate and transportation. So the first thing is obviously transportation is the number one source of greenhouse gas emissions, both in Vermont and nationally. So the sector has been a tough nut to crack. <laughs> So um, we have a lot of work to do here, and so clearly, um, if we're thinking about resiliency, if we're thinking about climate, we really have to get our arms around how we're gonna reduce emissions in the transportation sector. Um, so that's one thing that um, is a very direct connection. Another thing that we think a lot about is health. So if you think about um, air quality um, and the emissions that come from uh, on-road vehicles, um, there's significant impacts to um, our health, and they're not great. <laughs> and so people who live near major roadways um, suffer disproportionately from um, lung disease um, and all sorts of uh, health issues that come from proximity to, uh, to these uh, emissions. So that's another thing, and we could save a lot of money 
as a country and as a state if we were to um, reduce those impacts, those health impacts. And then the last thing, and I think probably everybody in this room is experiencing what it means to have volatile gas prices, right? So um, we're dependent on a world market um, for gas. Um, we know what's happening in Ukraine, and that's driving our gas prices up. There's probably a lot more going on with that. But Vermonters don't have the capacity to absorb high fuel costs. Um, we are a rural state. People are very dependent on their cars to get to their jobs and to get to the services they need to access. So I did a quick Google search yesterday. Average price of gas per gallon in Vermont is $4.71 as of yesterday. And for diesel, which powers trucks, and if you think about our buses, our public transit agencies are really suffering from diesel costs that are well over $6 a gallon. So um, when I think about resiliency, you know, household budgets, um, if you look at energy costs for, for household um, spending, transportation is the majority of energy spending in households in Vermont. Um, and it's not very elastic. So when prices go up, people just have to eat it because they really don't have options um, in a state like Vermont to, to do something different. Um, and so we've really got to think about this, not just from a climate perspective, but how do Vermonters adjust and how do they address um, uh, the need to change to cleaner transportation, healthier transportation, and more affordable transportation? So, um, so essentially what I'm here for my frame, I'm like, we got to do something different. So we have spent 100 years um, developing our communities um, and developing our state to really um, accommodate one type of transportation, which is a car on a road, a paved road. And that's worked really well for us, but it's not working for us now, and it won't into the future. It doesn't work for our families who are dependent on personal vehicles to get where they need to go. It doesn't work for our health, and it certainly is not working for our climate. So um, we have some really tough decisions to make as a state. We've got to decide how do we got a lot of money we spend on transportation. How are we going to make the shift? How are we going to get to cleaner electric vehicles? What's the infrastructure we need, need to build out for that? What do we have to do in terms of providing incentives so people can afford those vehicles, particularly lower income Vermonters? And what are we going to do to build out other options? Not everybody can afford a car. Um, not everybody can drive. So what's out there for people who are in that position? Um, what's our public transit system look like? What's our bike ped infrastructure look like in our communities? And what is the community design that's going to support that infrastructure? And um, I've been in many meetings where people are all for these goals. Like, yes, we want more bikes. We want more walking. We want more transit. But when it comes down to it, and we have to make a decision about paving our roads, or investing a little bit more in sidewalks or bikes or transit, yeah, we got to go with the roads. <laughs> so I'm here to um, have a call to action. When you're in your communities, think about the choices that you're making um, and what kind of a future that's supporting for us in our transportation sector. Thanks, John. Yep. Neil, you want to pick it up from there? I would love to pick it up from there. And uh, I, I, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about thermal uh, the thermal sector and what we need to do in the thermal sector to be more resilient in the future. But I want to go back a little bit and just pick up uh, something that Sarah mentioned. I had the uh, honor and privilege of being uh, the first Irene recovery officer uh, following the disaster now 12 years ago, almost 12 years ago. And uh, I can tell you I had, I had the experience that a lot of Vermonters had, which is seeing the devastation firsthand. And it was, it was massive, and I don't recount the numbers, but there were 500 miles of state roads, there were 300 state bridges. The town highways were devastated end to end of the state, not in every place, but in nearly all the small places where the, the banks are steep and the rivers run uh, deep and the rain came down and washed everything away. And it wasn't, but the roads were the thing that were the most visible, but it took homes, it took infrastructure, and it have impacted lives and communities. And it, it was a, definitely a turning point for me. I'd seen plenty of disaster before in one way or another, but to see it so close and to see how fragile Vermont is uh, for things that are now occurring more frequently and with more devastation with climate change, it, it, 
it connected some parts of my brain that hadn't been quite connected before. And, and to me, for me, it was understanding that this is a very, this network is fragile and we need to make it stronger and more resilient for the future. And that cuts across all these different areas. So transportation is a key one. Um, because we, uh, all the things that Jen said are absolutely right. It can't be just about the roads and bridges. Those are critical, but that's only one dimension. And in thermals, the, the same way. And we've largely, like the internal combustion engine and the cars that go on the roads, we've largely heated our homes the same way for uh, more than 100 years. Uh, and it is through burning carbon-based fuel sources um, and emitting that carbon. Uh, I, I, I currently in my, my job right now, I, I run Vermont Gas. Um, we, are, we have traditionally been a, a, a company that serves natural gas, fossil gas, mined out of the earth, transported via, via pipeline to Vermont and sent to people's homes through pipes under the ground. In a lot of ways, that's a very resilient system. During Tropical Storm Irene, none of the pipes of Vermont Gas were impacted. It's buried six to 10 feet under the ground. It's encased in a hard either steel or, or a high density polyethylene <clears throat> pipe. Um, so it wasn't impacted by the, the weather that was around. But another frame, it's also killing the planet. I mean, we'll be honest, like it's fossil gas. It, it emits carbon. The methane uh, is 20 to 30 times more uh, dangerous than the, the carbon dioxide emissions, the methane that may be released um, through, uh, through the pipe. So we have to recognize from a natural gas perspective that the product that we've been serving that is safe and reliable, is resilient and be helpful to Vermonters is also long-term making us weaker as a planet and as a society. And so as a company, we've been focused on that. But we're only one small part of the state. Uh, we, we serve the, the uh, Franklin, Chittenden, and Addison counties. We don't serve the rest of the, the state where it's largely served with oil and propane. Um, and, and of course, wood, which is a, another a key component of keeping Vermont warm. Taken together, this is 34% of our carbon emissions in Vermont, um, which is a, would be only second behind uh, transportation. So we have to be thinking about how we can help Vermonters build, uh, and install, and, and, and maintain systems that are sustainable and renewable for the long term. It could be part electrification. That's going to be a big part of, of our thermal future, is how we electrify uh, the things that are now uh, burning uh, f uh, fossil, f fossil fuels. Um, it's finding other ways to serve the fuels, uh, whether that's through biofuels, renewable natural gas, uh, biomass, uh, advanced wood heating, these are all options. Uh, and I think importantly is how we do it quickly. You know, we don't have forever. If we had 50 years to fix this problem, yeah, you could probably figure it out in 50 years. But we don't have 50 years. We got to get on it right away. And so uh, I think we can, and I'm happy to come back and talk about this, learning some of the lessons of Irene and COVID. We, we cannot forget the lessons of these disasters. And the public uh, uh, re uh, memory of these disasters tends to run about a year after the disaster ends. That is not long enough. We have to, so we need to take, we need to sort of, if you say, capitalize on the fact that it's on our minds right now. Irene's still on our minds. We're still feeling the impacts of Irene. We need to remember these things, remember the climate uh, emergency that we have, and move quickly across all of these areas. Yes, um, so I work for the Vermont Housing Finance Agency, and maybe unlike VEIC or Vermont Gas, maybe th those initials don't roll off the tongue with the same awareness uh, for this crowd, so I'll just orient you to let you know that we are a statewide affordable housing lender. So which of these things is not like the other? <laughs> it's me. Uh, I, I do housing, I do finance. Um, but that being said, as Neil said, with 34% of the thermal um, uh, emissions, VHFA has a long history of really focusing on this, and that has increased in the last few years. So um, really, VHFA, we are mission-driven. We're quasi-governmental. I could tell you all about us. But um, we run a mortgage lending program for lower-income home buyers, a lot of times first-time homeowners. And then we also uh, lend and give tax credits to developers of large multifamily rental properties. And so in my world, 
When someone says, I want you to talk about housing, I immediately ask them to pick one of two paths. Are we going to talk about homeownership or are we going to talk about rental housing? Because they're very different worlds, even within my world. And that, for this conversation, gets even more uh, nuanced and complex. Because housing is a public good. I think we all know about Maslow's hierarchy of need and how we all benefit from when we are affordably, safely, securely housed in decent housing, and that that helps us all. And that as a society, we need each other to be housed. It actually doesn't work when there are large swaths of us without homes. And we, we've seen an increasing number of that since the pandemic as, as Vermont's homelessness count goes up. So this is a public good that uh, is rooted, I mean, think about our educational system is rooted really in where we live. Uh, our civic governance and who we vote for and all that is rooted in where we live and, and where we're citizens of. And so it's a public good, but it is delivered through only private markets. Hmm. Think about your realtors, your lenders with approval and your mortgage, also through um, all of the, uh, your credit checks and all the things and or through your private landlords. And so it, as Jen was saying, it gets very complicated when you try to reach public policy goals like climate resilience and energy efficiency goals and all this through public, I mean, through private markets. And so VHFA tries to bridge the two of those in some ways and sometimes we really get proud of like a new weatherization effort that we're working on and there's other ways that we really fall short because we feel like even we don't have control over the entire system. And that is at the nut and, and why I think there is a commonality between transportation and thermal because that's what, what these two fields share is that this really is individual making choices about where they're going to live, how they're going to get around, that impact all of us collectively. From VHFA's perspective, again, as a mission-driven lender, <clears throat> we're very focused on low and moderate income Vermonters. That's who our mission is, is, and our statute says, who we're here to serve. And so I plan to speak probably too much about the affordability issues that come into these thermal um, efficiency conversations. We do have a climate crisis right now, and we have a housing crisis. And those two are both happening simultaneously, and we cannot forget each other as we move the ball down the field with each of these. They are symbiotic, and to solve these problems, we need to take both into account simultaneously. From my perspective as an affordable housing lender, I am routinely raked over the coals for the high cost of housing, sometimes as if it were personally my fault, <laughs> uh, but other times just really as a spokesperson for affordable housing in the state, why is it so expensive? And when I talk about what it costs to build an apartment, a rental apartment, small, modest, in a multifamily building, and people challenge me and say, why does it cost the same to build an apartment in a building as it does to build a single family home. Like how does, how is that math working? And we start to talk about, well, to build an affordable apartment, we don't just, we always use the phrase, pave a cornfield and put it anywhere. But in Vermont, we value smart growth. We want to think about the transportation connections. We want to think about where the jobs are. We want to think about that resiliency so that we don't keep putting homes on the side of those riversides that we saw get flushed out with Irene, but instead site these homes somewhere safer where they can be more resilient. We also need to think about um, historic preservation and building our downtowns. There's, um, oh, I'm blanking on the term, the carbon sequestration uh, that's possible when we reuse buildings and we don't always build new, but we, we repurpose schools, uh, uh, religious institutions, dormitories, uh, now commercial spaces that are maybe not going to be used for offices anymore. You know, there's a real value in doing that. There's a value in housing the most vulnerable among us and making sure that we have some units, some apartments set aside for people without homes and that we wrap social services around those folks so that they can also be resilient in their future. 
And then there's the, the pure energy carbon emission questions of, is this a net zero building? Is this an all electric building? Are you using biofuels? Are you um, building in redundant systems that are using the newest technologies? All those things have costs. So don't let any of us housers fool you that it's just the energy stuff that costs a lot. <laughs> All those things I mentioned have costs, building downtowns um, and housing the homeless and doing all that. But every time we add what a houser would call an extra cost to something, it's hard because it's so darn expensive to just pave a cornfield and pop up an ugly square building. So every time we add to that cost, it does become a trade-off, as, as Jen was saying. And so there are a lot of exciting new construction technologies, new ways to think about planning and zoning and siting of housing. There's a lot of lessons that we learned through Irene that continue to shape what we're doing today. And yet, I have in my office, because I reference it so much, I actually went out and bought a mobile. And it's just so important to remember through all this that when you're pulling on one part of that mobile, you really are affecting all of those other pieces and they all start swirling and acting differently. And sometimes that's really beneficial and we learn and grow and we're farther forward. And sometimes we just have to take some risks and try some new things and see what happens and learn and grow from that as well. So I'm gonna stop my comments there. I think the rest will do Thank questions. Thank you so much. Right, can we pull we up my presentation? Yeah, we have it here. What? I'm going to tie it all together. So one more thing I want to add to a new apartment, an EV charger. Oh, yeah. I want an electric say. vehicle charging station. So the, the <laughs> contrast is a little iffy here at the pictures. But what I, my perspective on this is my, my research interest, I, I teach here at Norwich University, is looking at electric vehicles. We need to have more electric vehicles to make the transportation sector more resilient. And when you look at an electric vehicle, how many people think they're zero emission? Good, nobody raised their hand. They are zero emission at the tailpipe, but at the factory, the power plant, to produce electricity, it's not zero emission. So on the left here, there's a, an internal combustion engine vehicle, which is 80% thermal wasted energy, uh, emitting a cloud of water vapor. And on the right is a coal plant in Michigan emitting a cloud of water vapor, but other stuff being emitted as well. So I like to look at the environmental impacts of the switch to the electrification of the transportation sector. Next slide, please. Possibly. So as we all know, EVs, uh, electric vehicles, whether they're battery electric, the green, or plug-in hybrids, which have smaller capacity batteries in them, have grown substantially over the, the past decade or so. Uh, click again, please. And the trend is continuing to be even more. So this next slide, this next graph here was pre-geopolitical issues where there's fewer, uh, less fuel supply around the world. So I expect the, the green and, and probably the blue to, definitely the blue and probably the green to grow even more by 2030. Next slide, so more electric vehicles. And as, as uh, the panel has mentioned, electric vehicles or transportation rather accounts for about a third of the energy consumption in the state and a big chunk of the emissions. So what are we going to do? What's going to happen when we electrify electric vehicles? Clicky? Well, in Vermont, uh, in New England, this is from ISO New England, we get a lot of our energy from what we consider to be somewhat clean sources, uh, natural gas, nuclear, renewables, hydro, and other sources. So if you're charging an electric vehicle in New England, you know, we're using pretty clean sources. So the environmental impact would appear to be sort of minimized. Next click. The problem is, to the west of us, the Midwest, this is the uh, Midwest ISO uh, plot here, the dark color is coal, which is not so clean. And which way it is, what's the prevailing wind from west to east? So a lot of the pollutants from the, the Midwest come across New England. So we will have to deal with electrification of vehicles, not in Vermont, not in New England, but across the United States, across the world, really. So next slide, please. And on top of this, so electric vehicles are, are great. Uh, zero emissions at the tailpipe. You can charge them with solar panels at your house with your EV charging station and solar panels. But in, in Vermont, we have cold weather and we have hills. 
So the EPA does all their testing with not so cold weather and not so hilly conditions. So this vehicle, I actually tested this vehicle back in the early 2000s, and this was a, a custom-made electric vehicle. And for those of you that were here in the last um, session, this vehicle has a uh, actually a grid size, grid type battery chemistry. It's not lithium ion. It's sodium nickel chloride, molten sodium nickel chloride. So you have to keep the salt warm to keep it uh, liquefied. So it has an active heating system to keep the battery warm. Even with the active heating system, as temperatures decrease, the range on this vehicle decreased by 52%. So now you take an EV with a stated range of 250 miles, and in Vermont you get 125 miles out of it in the winter. So what, is it, what does that mean? You need twice the amount of electricity to charge it. So now you have even more charging demands on the uh, electric vehicles. So it seems like a lot of problems. I uh, you know you pollute them. They don't work as well in the winter. Uh, they don't work as well in the hills. But where there's a problem, there's an opportunity. You know, as, as engineers and scientists, we always look at a problem as an opportunity. So on the left, we have the ice in New England, uh, daily, somewhat hourly grid profile, uh, power profile. So you get these peaks of power demand. People go home at night, turn on the stoves and the TVs uh, and the washing machines. You get these large peaks, and you get the valleys in the day when solar panels are producing electricity. Electric vehicles can help solve that problem. <coughs> so vehicle to grid. So you can hook a v EV up to the charger, which communicates and is controlled by the utility, and the electric vehicle can help offset some of those uh, large peaks or level out the demand peaks, which helps the utilities. And it makes us more resilient because now, anybody see the F-150 lightning commercials? The power goes out, you hook your truck up to your house, and now you have a generator to run your house for some time. <laughs> so with large weather events, you can have your own little small generator sitting in your driveway, potentially. And the utilities have a battery storage uh, utility sitting at people's houses that have electric vehicles. So I look at it from the environmental impact and the uh, grid impact of electric vehicles. That's what I'm interested in. So thank you. Thank you. All right. So there's a lot of expertise on this panel, as you can tell. We're going to start off with a few questions uh, from Valeria and I, and then we'll turn it over to you for your audience questions as well. We'll leave plenty of time for that at the end. Um, so we're going to take things back a little bit. Neil, you talked a lot about the recovery from Tropical Storm Irene. That's sort of the impetus, you know, we're here and the 10-year the anniversary of, of, or now 11-year, but uh, of Irene, and we're still feeling the impacts, as you said. We're still seeing what happened in the rebuilding. Can you, and anyone who wants to from the panel, talk about how the rebuilding efforts are, are still kind of playing into your work now? What, have we, what did we do in that rebuilding that still impacts how we are moving forward in the transportation and thermal sectors today? <laughs> well, I, I, uh, I, I, I could tell you just briefly on the transportation part of it on an infrastructure level. I know this is not my area, but I have a little expertise in this area, is that a lot of the building designs following Tropical Storm Irene were updated. Um, you know, the, the, the state, as I mentioned before, the state lost nearly 300 bridges that were impacted. Um, the towns lost hundreds of bridges. There were a thousand culverts that got washed out. All of this w was um, set in motion a change to the design standards so that culverts are oversized and bridges are oversized. I say that to, to say that there, so that the design of transportation systems at a real physical level adjusted, which which makes sense because we're going to have more flooding events with climate change. It doesn't address the, the root problem. I mean, we're just dealing with the effects of climate change by changing the hydraulic structures of these, of these infrastructure systems. Um, so it, I think that to really have a discussion about what changed is it changed our thinking around the things we have to do to get these systems to be sustainable so that we in Vermont are a small part, a, a small part or a leading part of how we create sustainable systems that slow the effects of climate change. Because it, it's gotten worse, it's going to get worse, but we can stop it from being really bad. And it will, I mean, people, I think, are feeling it and seeing it here in Vermont in ways that they hadn't before. Our flooding events are more frequent. I mean, that, that, is, that is happening in Vermont. That's, that's the, the statistics behind it. You know, we certainly are feeling the temperatures increase in the summer, increase in the winter, um, even though we might be seeing more precipitation, which might look like more snow. It actually is coming from a warming planet, not a cooling planet um, uh, in the winter. So all these things are going to be, be more water flowing. 
around. Um, so I would just go to a thermal side. Coming back to what I said before, I think it really influences how we think about building systems um, on, on the thermal side to, to withstand disasters, but also making them more sustainable. The good news is that those two things can go together. And we can put in, uh, just like Mike was saying, we can put in a, uh, for a home, a battery charging system that runs from an EV, a Tesla power pack on the wall, solar on the roof that can go at a moment's notice off grid if the power systems go out. Or if the, the fuel truck can't make it, you can run on a heat pump on your own, on your own battery powered system. That's technology, that's not in the future, that's technology we have today. Um, you know, I run, after I leave here, I'm going up, we have a, a little place in Danville, uh, Vermont, that's completely off grid. We run it four seasons completely off grid and it runs perfectly fine. Um, it took a little work to set it up, but these systems are becoming, I mean, it's so easy, even I can figure it out. So that, that could tell you, I mean, it keeps us warm in, in, in the winter and cool in the summer. Um, these things are commercially available today. And, and if you look back 10 years ago, you know, people, some people had backup generators and a wood pile. To, it was in the middle of summer, so they didn't need the wood, but they could keep themselves warm for a couple days. Uh, but now with the, with the sort of increasing prevalence of these off-grid systems that are grid-tied, um, we're going to see more resilience at a, at a home level on the thermal and electric sides. taught us that we have to be prepared not only for um, natural disasters, but other types of disaster. So the question here is, uh, did the resilience that we have built since Tropical Storm Irene help with COVID? How were the impacts of COVID similar or different? I could, um, I can take a crack at it because the impacts of COVID were, were really interesting on the transportation side because people stopped going to work. Um, right or people that didn't have to go to a location, I should say, because yeah. some people had to continue to go to work, and that's where our public transit system really kicked in for people that needed to get to a job site, and the fact that it was there was, was critical for, for many people. Um, so, you know, I don't know if people remember the beginning of the pandemic, seeing pictures of places like Lo Los Angeles and Seattle and Beijing. <laughs> Suddenly, you can, like, see, oh, hey, there's mountains there, and <laughs> the skies cleared up because so many vehicles were on the road. And so those of us who are thinking about clean transportation were like, hallelujah. This is like the world that we've been hoping for, <laughs> that we've got clean skies and people are working from home. So, and I think that, um, you know, what I think a lot of people are thinking about um, in relation to that is, what's the future gonna look like in terms of where people work? Um, because that has a direct correlation to, you know, how people need to access their community and um, the pollution that we're experiencing from transportation. And um, so I think a lot of people are thinking not everybody's going to go back to work or they're not going to go back full time. So that's one thing that, but I, I think it's still an open question. Um, but what do we need in place to support that? Broadbands? <laughs> so people that can work at home, do they have the infrastructure to support that? So, you know, a lot of people are thinking about the connection between broadbands and transportation emissions, um, because if you can't work at home, you gotta get somewhere, which means you gotta get in your car. So that's one thing that we're um, thinking a lot about. The other thing um, that I think is really interesting is that people, there was a sharing economy that was burgeoning before the pandemic. Everybody was super excited about you know, ride sharing, Uber, Lyft, um, all sorts of innovation that was coming. Um, and, you know, sort of that shared economy was really um, a big mega trend, actually. And the pandemic really sort of put the brakes on that. So that was, in my opinion, an unfortunate thing that it's going to take a long time for us to recover from. And you got to think broadly about ride sharing. It's not just, you know, those cool, you know, apps, it's public transit and how comfortable, when are people gonna be comfortable getting back on the bus um, and, and using those services. I think the risk we have as a state is if, um, you know, services like public transit are really only for those who absolutely have to use it and, and not for folks that have a choice um, to use it. And um, that's when you get uh, a disinvestment in a, a really important public asset. So I think there's some risk um, to public transit, um, depending on sort of how things recover from, from the pandemic. But 
and I could probably add some more, but those are some themes that uh, definitely sort of emerge, big themes um, from the pandemic and mm -hmm. transportation. Your comment about uh, public transit being for those um, who may not have the means and so um, the disinvestment that happens is what I was thinking about when it comes to housing because for me the, the common element between Irene and the pandemic was the universe can't say the word, universality of the impact and how it just affected a cross cut of Vermonters. And again, from my perspective, who specifically works with people who are of lower income, I constantly see the needs and the impacts and um, the problems that are disproportionately impacting the folks I'm working with. And so, dare I say, and I see I'm being recorded, it, it is a little refreshing when impacts have a broader um, uh, touch to all of us because Kevin and I were speaking of this earlier, it is somewhat refreshing for all of us to say, you know what, maybe it's not because they made bad choices to not weatherize their home or not get the fuel pump or something like that. Maybe it's just the reality that we can't all weatherize our home with the latest technologies and go off grid and do these things and, and that there are other realities that impact all of us. So from a housing perspective, 72% of us own our homes. And so when I'm out there talking about what we need to do to build housing for Vermonters coming in and having it be resilient and sited in the right places and all that, 72% of us kind of have a permanent spot and maybe we don't want that to change and, ha and have to um, have out our backyard look any different or things like that. And uh, when these events come through, I think it challenges all of us to really take a step back and say, where are we as a state and how do we want to provide not only for the 640,000 of us who happen to be here today, but the future of our state. And that, that building toward the future was the other commonality I see with housing that was really happening a lot in the, um, months and years after Irene was we were talking about, okay, we just got hit with this huge storm and we see the impacts of um, what's happening. Let's build something different. And that was very structurally based, meaning again, where you put your homes and how they're built and the construction types and all that. Now with the pandemic, and I want to bring in the racial justice reckoning, and and just I can, I'm going to keep taking the word resilient and just building it out. I'm not I'm not so much just looking at um, greenhouse gas emissions, but I'm just saying for Vermont to be resilient, we need to think about what Vermont looks like in the future, and so what that housing looks like, what the climate impacts look like, but also the humanity of who's here, who's welcome, and where they're going to be. And, and how close will they be to their jobs and what we want to build as a state. Thank you. We have lots of questions that we could ask. But we're gonna, we want to turn it over to the, to the crew. So I'm going to add one more, uh, ask one more question and then we're going to turn it out to, to audience Q&A. I want to bring it down to the community level because I know we have a lot of people who are here representing their communities and thinking about what they can be doing. And, and now's a really interesting time to be working in a community, in a municipality, because there's ARPA dollars that are coming in. Um, if you could, I'm, I'm going to phrase it as if you could pick your favorite thing, but obviously I know there's so many things to choose from. You can talk about more than one. But for communities to be investing in right now, with the, with the funds that are available or with long-term uh, you know, municipal funding, what is the thing that communities should really be thinking about from, from, your, from your seat of where you live? And maybe, Michael, we'll start with you and then come this way this time. Sure. Uh, this kind of ties <coughs> into what you mentioned about the you know, fear of riding on a bus potentially in the future. I live in Moncton small little town, three hills that way. And we built a park and ride. I don't see a single car there uh, anymore. Uh, we started uh, the, I forget the name of the bus, but it's a small bus that takes you to the bigger bus in Hinesburg, which takes you to other places. I'm not sure it comes through our park and ride anymore. But what I do see driving around are Teslas, a couple, either in town or through town, but not a single charging station. That's one of the big issues with EVs is this distributed network of, of charging stations. So I would love to see 
a charging station at our park and ride, potentially, uh, or maybe two of them at our park and ride, either user funded or some sort of, you know, you're doing good for the environment, so you get a very reduced rate or free charging at the charging station. So I think that um, scattered through Vermont and then getting us through the across the country would be a, a good way to, in my, that's on my wish list of things to see. I would say what I see in communities across the state um, are cemetery commissions. I, I think most towns have a cemetery commission if they have a cemetery. Um, and there, there have been a lot of energy commissions that have grown since Irene, I think largely, but over the past 10, 15 years. And I think we're not yet up to a dozen housing commissions in the state. Again, maybe a little off color, but so we seem to care more about the people who've gone before us, who are now six feet underground, than we do, you know, our current residents and the future of the state. And, and that value judgment is, is a hard one to grapple with. Um, so I, VHFA has put a lot of resources into um, trying to stand up and support housing commissions in the state, not so we can bulldoze every cornfield and, and put housing everywhere, but so that we can be really thoughtful about communities planned for growth and those that are not. But I, so I, if you went on to VHFA's website, you would find this whole housing ready toolkit, you would find all sorts of data, you could do a housing needs assessment, you could see what policies in the housing world work and what don't. and and all this, but I'm even finding a problem with what I'm preaching recently, which is, and I'm gonna use South Burlington as an example, which actually has an affordable housing committee, and they have a conservation committee and an energy committee, and we're finding, we're getting back to what we do, which is then getting rooted in the lens we brought to the table. Like, I'm the housing person, so I have to represent housing, and I talk about housing. God forbid I talk about equity or energy or other issues. And so there is something to be said for, in Vermont, we do have um, a 35-year history of bringing housing and conservation together through an organization that was created, the housing, Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. They're similar to VHFA, but very different, separate organization. And there is something about challenging us to, that organization has a dual mission in their statute and what they have to do is they have to equally consider the housing impacts and the conservation, energy, agriculture, working lands impacts. And I think that that is fascinating. And I wish that more communities could take that kind of approach and not act like we're gonna do housing here and we'll do transportation in this room and then, oh, energy is separate and equity is different than all that and instead recognize the intersectionality of this and that when we are funding housing, we absolutely need to be held accountable to make sure that that housing is green and clean and resilient and put in the right places and all of that. We cannot separate the two. We can't act like I can go and put millions of dollars into a housing development somewhere and not think that that has huge energy implications. And you can't go putting parking rides without thinking about the EV charging and all that. It's just that intersectionality is the thing that I want to find more ways to overcome. And so I am excited by new efforts. Neil and I are both a part of a weatherization at scale initiative that the Energy Action Network has really supported. And we are working with VEIC and Efficiency Vermont. Uh, I know you're different, same. I always get thrown by that. Um, <laughs> on, uh, on really, and several other partners, on really trying to bring weatherization to the 90,000 more homes that need it. And it was, you know, we would chuckle a bit about the, the pairing of, you know, I show up and I just know housing, I don't know anything about energy, and then uh, Efficiency Vermont and Neil and others know all this stuff about energy, and, 
Um, it really has been such a growth opportunity for our organization, and I think for a lot of us participating on it, to really see the intersectionality. And now, we are so excited by what's next, because we're working right now on making weatherization for moderate income households who don't qualify for uh, the weatherization assistance program to have it be more affordable, but now we're going, oh, we need to do panel upgrades so that when the EVs come to the homes or the PV solar or something, that those homes are set up for success. We need to look at um, electrifying more of our homes, but we also need to look at the health safety repairs that need to be done when doing weatherization and the like. And so that's, um, that's what I want to see more of in the future. That, that just amen to the, the, the bringing folks together because more and I have worked on this weatherization together and it, it, we were all these energy folks were talking and we were like we there's so much we don't know about the housing world but more brought all that and we it was a really it's been a, a wonderful partnership that we've been able to advance so far so I think that's a great idea we should do that in communities I want to pick up on a theme you had in your last answer to your last question and tie it back to what I'd spend the ARPA money on. Magic wand. So going back to your earlier question, like what did we learn from Irene? Uh, Irene was, we at a, at a physical destruction level, disproportionately impacted low income Vermonters. They lived in floodplains, there was a cheap land, they had, they had mobile homes, they had, they had small homes next to rivers, they were washed away. And it, it was a reminder that often natural disasters or, or even COVID, it can impact these low and moderate income communities more than they can other communities. And so when we think about the future and how we spend ARPA money, I wouldn't so much say we spend it on, on, on what we spend it on, where I would spend it is who we spend it on, is we should, when, so, so when we think about new technology, often we're trying to, when we think about EVs or solar panels or heat pumps or whatever it is, we want to give a little incentive to get it going because we want to try to give the littlest incentive to get it going so we can do more of those things. But when we do that, we are not really helping low and moderate income families because they don't have the money to spend, to buy the EV or to put the heat pump in or, or do whatever that thing is that's going to be so important. We actually have to give a big incentive to low and moderate income families. So I would take that ARPA money, whether it's in our communities or at the state or nationally, and I would spend it all or nearly all of it on low and moderate income Vermonters in order to get them the, the help they need right out of the gate to get some of these technologies in place. Because it's not going to be, you know, a heat pump's not going to be of any use for them if they can't actually get it installed. And neither will an EV. Um, we have to really help them in a way that may, that may feel a little um, uncomfortable for us because we don't want to give a big incentive. But it's a big incentive is exactly what we need to do. So I would use this, that money to help low and moderate income almost exclusively uh, to help them get ahead for the next, in advance of the next disaster. And I need to say amen to that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll be brief. So I think um, in transportation, what we're really, to get to a, a lower carbon future, it really is asking people to do something different than what they're doing now. And I think we all understand how hard behavior change is. Um, but it gets a lot easier when people are in an environment that supports that shift. So I think when it comes to transportation, that's creating the community design that makes it easier to do something other than get into your car by yourself mm. to do whatever you're doing. So um, that could be smart growth, like you've been talking about. Where, where is housing cited and where is it in proximity to the things that people need to access? Um, it's also looking at the, our roads. So for so long, that's been the domain of road engineers <laughs> that are, and it's, a, it's murky for people, regular people, to be like, well, how does this all work? And how are these decisions made? But we actually have policy in the state of Vermont called Complete Streets that says whenever somebody's doing work on a road, you got to consider the needs of all users and all modes of transportation. So the question is, is that happening in your community? Are people saying, OK, you're laying out that pavement. Where's the bike lane? How are gonna, people going to safely cross that road? Is there a pull-off for transit if you have transit in your community? So it's when you have those safe environments for people to do something different, that's when it makes it easier for people to start to make, do something different when they can. 
Now, obviously, we can't make, you know, people aren't going to bike from Peachum to Burlington. Like, we know that. But maybe they can, in their community, go from their home to the grocery store to the post office to school. Um, and that's a trip that is then not in a vehicle. Um, so I do think that we have a lot of control. I think we've ceded a lot of control to experts. Um, and what we really need to do is bring a community voice and values into that conversation and say, this pavement is all of ours. And is it working for everybody in the community and um, helping us get to the future we want, which is something where people don't have to get in their car every time they want to do something in their community. So I think that's, you know, something we have to do. And I think that the people that work on our roads um, are open to that. It's just they've, they've been in charge and nobody's really pushing back all that much. So I would say ask those questions in your community. And we have a lot of money coming in, so there's going to be a lot of projects. <laughs> and then I would just echo Michael. I think that um, probably one of the biggest investments in clean transportation that's coming is um, EV infrastructure. There's billions of dollars um, going out across the country in ARPA and in um, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act. So um, that is something that all communities should have um, some funding to support uh, in the future. So look at, um, I would definitely echo what Michael said. Where do you want that in your community and how is that going to support folks who want to drive EVs? Thanks, Jen. Yep. I, I have to give a brief plug coming off of what you just said. Uh, I'm also the chair of the Northfield Energy Committee, speaking of working in communities, and today there's a placemaking demo downtown in Northfield to show what, what, what are the problems, what, how are our streets not complete right now, and how could they be made complete? What are the simple changes that could be made? So that's an idea of how to kind of get that conversation started in your community. I can't take credit for that placemaking event, let me just say, um, but it's being put on uh, here in Northfield. On the same day. One, one thing, especially with e-bikes. Yeah. I mean, they are a revelation. Yeah. They are people, a rel and, revelation. But they need a spot. They, some people need a place to go on them. Because yeah. you'll get a lot more people using e I mean, they're selling like hotcakes. And, uh, but they need, people need to be able to ride them somewhere. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And actually, e-bikes are a really interesting innovation in the transportation world because I think people are seeing cargo bikes, so people can put their kids on them. They can, yeah. put their gro they can actually do a full grocery shop with a cargo bike yeah. on an e-bike. So that's really changing things. Um, Massachusetts is a state we're working in. We're actually going to be doing a pilot with Cape Lake Compact, which is a utility on Cape Cod to do an e-bike incentive program that's really centered in equity. It's like for all the people that can't afford a car with an incentive can afford an e-bike and they can probably do the majority of the travel they need with an e-bike. Um, so it's a really, um, and uh, one of the um, state entities down in Massachusetts is putting millions of dollars into e-bike um, pilots to test out how these this, these new technology can meet equity needs for a variety of communities and populations. That's cool. All right, That's really so a cool. lot of uh, fodder for, for discussion. We'll open it up to questions. And of course, uh, as many of you know, uh, we've been the community partner with GMT on My Ride uh, by GMT, which is a uh, uh, micro transit uh, pilot project now in its second year. Uh, the first year uh, we were focusing on the transition of uh, transit dependent riders to the service because uh, they've been using it and this year we're really focusing on what we call choice riders and um, I just wanted to adjust your narrative a little bit because uh, the idea of, of ride sharing is actually becoming quite popular in Montpelier. And um, according to the American uh, survey, the, there are 650 uh, you know, uh, units in, or, or people in Montpelier who are uh, transit dependent. And yet, we're, we are now beyond, well beyond that, and growing by over 100 people every month of people who are now starting to use the service. And uh, our um, MTI grant this year is completely focused on choice riders. So this morning I got up and did a short video of uh, Peter Watt, who uh, works at the 
uh, high school, and, and his message was, my family can have one electric vehicle because I can take my ride to and from work. And, um, and so I, I make these little videos and have a QR code in the paper, and we have uh, these advertisements, so people are watching these little testimonials. Um, and uh, it, it's really uh, important for us to realize that there are, that my ride is not the only shared solution. Uh, Phoenix Mitchell in Worcester has piloted uh, the Hitching Post, which is uh, an opportunity for people to share rides with people in their community with no cost, without be it being public transportation. So I think that that um, you know sharing is really going to be, and, and I always like to quote the uh, Institute for Transportation and um, Public Policies and UCC Davis, which says that it's not just electrification. We love electrification. Yay, electrification. But it is ride sharing that is going to take us up to the level that we need to get to in order to really um, you know, reduce our, our miles, uh, our, our carbon footprint. And I love the image of the mobile. Everything is interconnected. It's been 100 years of the single occupancy vehicle. It's been the back to the land movement, which truncated the construction of housing in our town, Montpelier. We would have 1,000 more housing units if people hadn't gone out and done their you know, 10 acre plot and caused the carbon problem that we now have with people you know, traveling so many rural miles. I so, want to make sure we you know, can get to other, we, other questions. Do you have a, do you have a question for no, the panel? No, and, and so I, I appreciate very much what you're saying. I think it is very unconnected, and I think it's, it's just um, tremendously important that we see that interconnection and that we uh, really encourage new pilots in all of this work. So, yeah. Yeah, I would just say that pilot is really innovative. It, um, it took a lot to get it off the ground. And so yeah, it, I do, I, it is um, really looking at how um, we can provide more on-demand service, really, um, and, and rather than fixed route. And so in a rural state like Vermont, that's a nugget that's really critical to providing services that are relevant to folks. So um, I'm glad you brought that up because that's a, it's a really exciting pilot, and I'm glad to hear that people are using it. Yeah, it's That's excellent. <laughs> and they, so that now they've done 12 feasibility studies throughout Vermont and other small cities, and three will be rolled out next year and more to follow. So, you know, as you say, it's not the silver bullet, but it's it's one of many other options that are out there. And three common types of lock-in that exist uh, within the energy sector are technological lock-in, institutional lock-in, and social lock-in. Uh, and to convert those into barriers to change, what uh, specific technological, institutional, and social barriers do y'all view as the biggest impediments to increasing the resilience of Vermont's heating and transportation systems? Yeah, sorry. No, wait. Yeah. So, I don't worry so much about the technological lock-in, if I'm understanding you correctly, because I feel like since Irene, there has been a revolving door of new technologies in the housing sphere that um, we have tried out, maybe adopted, maybe left behind, um, and uh, we could talk about Vermods and, and lots of different construction types there. It's the institutional that um, is what I think the biggest barrier with housing, and that is that the money pays for this thing. And so when you wanna do this, and that's where we get into those silos, and I talk about intersectionality, housing money, like I don't wanna have all my housing money go to pay for biomass, energy, whatever the thing is, because I need it to be for housing, and so energy should pay for that, and energy's not paying for that. And so it's that institutional, funding streams that I find most frustrating because I can't pay for that, but I know it has to be a part of what I'm doing. Other thoughts? And I, I think this is a good opportunity to sort of close out with, with oh. some final thoughts for the panel as well. 
All right, well, all good. Go um, <laughs> I, 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 I agree. On, on, I think there are legitimate technological issues around, around lock-in, um, especially on heating with replacement assistance. That's a whole separate side topic. But if you solve the institutional lock-in problem, you start to solve the other, the technological problem. Um, you know, I run a gas company, and like one of the things that we have to forget, truly forget, is that all that energy comes in a pipe. <laughs> you know, it seems like a very simple thing. It doesn't all have to come in a pipe. There are other ways to serve it. It could come through, you know, it, what something else can flow in the pipe. It can come through the electric lines. It can come through wood heating. But we have to be able to forget the thing that we've known forever. That's the lock-in that we have. Is like we've got this one way of doing business. So we can forget that, that or, or hold that thought aside for a second and realize there are other ways in our business to deliver warmth, which is essentially what we're all trying to do. Keep people warm. Keep them safe and warm during the winter. Give them fuel to run their business, but make sure that it's sustainable and renewable. There are a lot of ways to do that that doesn't have to be fossil fuels, doesn't have to come in a pipe, it doesn't have to, to, to be locked into this one way of doing it. And it is hard for these institutions, and our institution and other institutions, to change. But if we're able to, to set a couple ideas in motion and show that there's a path forward, others will follow. That's what we're doing in Vermont writ large as a state. We're doing that, and I think all of our, you know, our groups are trying to do it as individual organizations as well. I think that holds great promise for the future. Um, I would guess uh, I would say there's a behavioral lock-in in transportation, which is highly dependent upon personal mobility um, that's enabled by a car. Um, so we love that. You can get in your car and go anywhere if you have the money and the car. And um, in a state like Vermont, it's hard to build out other infrastructure for that. So I would say... Um, that's one of the biggest challenges we have. It's very hard to offer um, alternatives that can replicate that exactly. And a lot of times that's what we we're hoping to achieve. I would suggest that maybe that's too high a bar um, and that we can get a lot of what we have um, if we're willing to take a little li bit longer for the trip or go in a different way or... Um, plug in and you know so there's different I, I'm not so worried about the technology I feel like the technology is there it's the it's the single occupancy vehicle that has led to behave a certain behavior and the entire infrastructure that's built around it so I think that's really what we're trying to to deal with in transportation and as Neil said for you know buildings it's about keeping people warm and comfortable and for transportation, it's like people being able to access a quality of life. You know, get to a job, get to services, get to entertainment, engage in civic life. Um, and that's what that's really about. Um, so we just have to figure out a different way to offer that to everybody. <laughs> Professor Grass, any closing thoughts? Yeah, I just thought it was interesting. You mentioned you can get in your car and go anywhere. Well, if you have an EV, get, get in your car and go 250 miles. Before you recharge. Well, it's true for gas so, too. You gotta get. Yeah, but then you can fill a tank in five minutes versus true. fifteen yes. to twenty. So uh, rapid chargers will will help mm -hmm. that. But I, I think I'm not sure where where does affordability fall within those different categories you mentioned. Uh, it's probably impacted by all three, I would guess. Yeah. Uh, I think. Institutionally, subsidies, socially, when and how we choose to yep. use the technology that ultimately has the cost. So. I think it probably all three play a role. So I think it comes down to that, cover them all, affordability of whatever new technology we're talking about, electric vehicle. You look at a comparable electric vehicle unsubsidized to a gas-powered, and you're going to pay 30% more probably on average for an EV. So it's going to boil down to that for adoption, I think, is when they become more affordable, we will adopt. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to our panelists. We really appreciate your time here today. Thank you.